So now we have a poem called If We Must Die by Claude McKay, arguably his most famous poem. Um, Claude McKay uh, was born in Jamaica and first published uh, in the teens. And he published this poem in July 1919 in a magazine called The Liberator, which was the U.S., the American magazine most openly communist at the time. Uh, so, and he was attracted to communism, although uh, never became a member. So he is a, uh, a person of color and he is a radical. So he's got both of the things we've just been talking about. He's got, he's got left-wing radicalism of the Depression, or this is prior to the Depression, but certainly he participated then, uh, just after the Russian Revolution. And he's got, as you're going to see, um, the anger of someone responding to racist hatred and injustice based on American racism just after World War I. So my question to you is the same as before. Does the choice of form, does McKay's choice of poetic form enhance his message or detract from it? So let's see where we are. Emily, does, does the form of the poem detract from the message, the effectiveness of the message, the for me, yeah. Just it looking does. at the first line, let it let us not die like hogs, and to use such sort of stately, lofty form okay. when you're talking about All dying right. like pigs. All right. To Very me, good. We're just vote. We're just voting now. Although Emily offered an argument, that's nice. <laughs> so we're just voting. <laughs> to me, it enhances. Enhances. You disagree with your buddy. Yep. Cold. Is that the first time that's ever happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you sad? Dave? Uh, enhances. Enhance. Enhance. Definitely enhances. A hundred percent kidding. It absolutely detracts. <laughs> oh. Detracts, definitely. Okay, detracts. Uh, detracts. Detracts. I'm on the enhancement side. Whoa, you switched. Ooh. I can't keep track. <laughs> no, As they say in baseball, you need a program to know the players. All right. You said we could switch. So we have, what form do we have, Emily? I don't know, something rhymey. <laughs> oh, goodness. Count the, count the number of lines. Um... 14. That's 14. Good. Anytime you see a poem of 14 written in English, mm -hmm. French, Italian, and possibly Russian, you've got to say sonnet. Okay. It's a sonnet. And uh, what kind of sonnet is it, folks? Shakespearean. Shakespearean. We said that in unison. Uh-oh. We said the word Shakespeare. Uh. Hmm. Just the invocation of Shakespeare. Whose side does that help, Allie? Their side. Say the, the side of the detractors. Um, because it's in the uh, white male Anglo-Saxon tradition. Oh boy. Okay. Well, we better we better revisit that. Uh, what about the rhyme scheme? Is this a pure Shakespearean sonnet? We yeah. looked at a, we looked at an Italian or Petrarchan sonnet recently, which has the sestet and the octave, right? Six eight or is it eight six? I can't remember. Somebody better get me right here. Six eight eight six. Eight six. Eight six. Thank you. We'll we'll double check that. <laughs> but this is different. This is different. How does it work? It's uh, three stanzas: A B A B C D C D. There's no stanzas actually. Well, but I mean, but the rhyme three, scheme three rhyme acts schemes. as if it were in okay, stanzas. Very good. And then there's a a rhyming couplet at, at the, the end. end. Yeah. So it's A B A B C D C D E F E F. That second F. Um, no, that works. Yeah. E F E F, and then G G. Pack back. Okay, so it is a perfect, at least in terms of its outward form, it's a perfect Shakespearean sonnet. Okay, Emily, why does McKay's, what is, what's his message, by the way? We, I guess we better get that. What message? What's the content of this poem? What's he saying? What's he arguing? For counter-violence, fight violence with violence. Counter-violence. So he's saying if we are attacked, we need to, we need to strike back with killing force. Anybody want to, does anybody know about the particular historical context here? I mean, I can provide it, but Allie, you remember? Um, in 1919, well, yeah, 1919 Yeah, when you were around in 1919. Back in the day, <laughs> yeah. if I can remember that mm -hmm. far back. Um, 1919 was, um, I forget what it was called, I want to say the Red Summer, but it was a summer Red of Red Summer, yep, and um, race riots. Yeah. Uh, right after World War I, white soldiers come back to the urban centers, to the cities, and elsewhere, but this is particularly a conflagration of the cities. Uh, Detroit, Tulsa, Harlem, and New York. Chicago. Chicago, and I believe Newark, 
These were cities that exploded in that summer. Um, and this was partly because white soldiers had come home and black families had come from the South and there were many African-American families in the cities already, Chicago and New York in particular. And they had b been able to set, become shop owners and factory workers. And suddenly in a racist society, the, they were being displaced. And this, was, this has been called a desperate phase of the effort to return to pre-war normalcy, which is racial separation and economic disintegration. So this poem is an angry response to those riots where typically police who were supposed to be defending the victims of the riots, shop owners, black shop owners and citizens, stood back and watched and maybe even participated, sort of keeping the crowds at bay with their dogs and so forth. So you get that situation. So McKay is arguing that we should strike back. Okay, so is, this, is, a, is a sonnet a good vehicle for that, for that message, Max? I, yes, I'm on the side of, of enhancement. You think it time, works. So yes, um, I think uh, this is another case of, of of subverted form that I think is working effectively. Um, we have what is was typically a poem about love becoming sort of a, a call to arms, a poem about resistance. Um, and I think that there's something there's something great about that that classic sonnet turn happening after the first two there stanzas, is a turn. where mm -hmm. it's like it's, it becomes a call to arms. It becomes it becomes a very, a very o abrupt turn. Yeah, O Kinsman turns turns the poem. You're and saying? It, yeah, it becomes it becomes a turn, which is I think uh, completely paralleling the the idea of, of we have to turn turn back, turn to face them. Okay. Kinsman, it's time to go. Molly, I think uh, what Max said about how a sonnet is traditionally uh, a love poem is exactly why it doesn't work um, because it doesn't perfectly sort of fit into uh, the traditional form of the poem. Um, it's not able to subvert it. Whereas with County Collins' poem, Incident, um, because it puts you into the voice of an eight-year-old child, like that's why it works so well. But putting himself into the voice of an old white man in love isn't, isn't the right way to do this. Okay, but you used, the, the word right is a pretty powerful word. I'm glad you're taking such a strong position. Anna? Um, my problem is mostly with the language. Um, I mean, the form, is doing. What kind of language is this? If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot. It accursed is, is to be pronounced just as I've done it. It's like the highest poetic diction. The highest poetic diction, Shakespearean. Okay, you have a problem with that? I do have a problem with that because... Um, if this is a, a poem about, well, first of all, I mean, it's not only high poetic diction, but I mean, kind of like what Ali was hinting at earlier, it's the high poetic diction of Shakespeare and, and his like white contemporaries. Like this isn't the language of a Jamaican. This isn't how he speaks. This isn't how the kinsmen that he's talking about, this isn't how they speak. So he, you're saying, just to be as polite as possible here, he's saying, um, I will, I am speaking in a voice that's not thought of to be traditionally my own voice. I'm, I'm taking on a different voice. I think that, yeah? I mean, yeah, and I think that he should, if he's writing a poem of resistance, he should write a poem that resists in a way that speaks in, so his, own, in his own words. You're, a, you're, in a, you're a linguistic radical. You think that part of the oppression is the inheritance of this high high Just language. like establishment that like dictates okay. how poets Max should be is really looking worried about <laughs> I, this argument. I think it's very problematic for us to say or for anyone to say that he should be writing in a particular style that he should be writing in in what we would call Jamaican English. No, I don't mean that. I just mean that he should have his own voice. He shouldn't have to buy into the establishment but to write a good poem. He's, he's defining his own voice. And it's, I mean, it's perhaps like the greatest act of resistance to say that, no, I can write like this. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, if you're calling to people, this is a call to arms. If you're addressing your fellow man, I mean, realistically, is this the way that the people he's addressing talk? So let's talk about who's being addressed. Okay. In the poem, we have evidence of who's being addressed. Amaris, who's being addressed? There's evidence. 
It's been pointed out by Max. Is it his brothers then? Well, where's the or evidence? His where's the evidence? Americans? Oh, Kinsman. We just oh, Kinsman. That's an address, right? Okay. Okay, Dave, who are the Kinsmen? Uh, the other oppressed um, that he's talking to that he aligns himself with. But Do we um, know who they are from the poem? Uh, it's not clear. It's just he makes the distinction between uh, him and his oppressed brothers and monsters. Right. And he calls the oppressors mad and hungry dogs. So we have opposition. Cowardly. We have us and them. We have McKay and his kinsmen. We, O oh, kinsmen. And then we have others. Okay. Is he speaking directly then, Amaris, to those victims that we were talking about in the historical sense? Is he talking to those who are victims of racially motivated rioting? Well, I think he's trying to bring the two stories together of World War I and the race riots. Okay, but is he addressing them with O. Kinsman? I think he's talking about victims, yes. Okay, I got a yes out of that. Yes. He, he is, so now we're back to you guys. Molly and Anna and Max. I mean, I think so. He's, he's addressing them, but he's using a Shakespearean sonnet and a high, a very high, elevated language to do so. Is it possible that his address is complex and it's not just to those who are right now being barked at by dogs and fear for their lives, Molly? Who I, might he be talking to if he's not just talking to his literal kinsmen out there on the streets? Anybody want to guess? I mean, he could be talking to anyone who's ever been oppressed ever. Or he's but talking it's still to not the oppressors. Right. Yeah. Or he's talking to the oppressors. Who else might he be talking to? You know, Winston Churchill used this poem, read this poem on the BBC to encourage his fellow Britons to hold up under the nightly attacks of the German Air Force at the, dark, the darkest days of the English nation. He used this poem, taking at least race in terms of uh, uh, people of color, of, 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 of colonial inheritance and so forth, out and, and just speaking to his own national community, taking race out of the equation entirely, using this poem as a way of saying, we will fight back against the Nazis. Okay, I mean, he did that. He used that because, Churchill used that because he was borrowing from Shakespeare. He read this poem, he read the passage from Richard II, this sceptered isle, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. He read that, and he did that because he wanted to borrow from Shakespeare. And why did he want to borrow from Shakespeare, Max? What's the advantage for Churchill to have borrowed from Shakespeare? Because it, it's... What does it remind his it's, people? It's nationalist. It's, it's, Say he's, more. He's the bard. He's the greatest or considered to be the most canonical and greatest writer in the English language. And so by just it, using Shakespeare, you get what? You get pride. It, 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 and it, it imparts some sort of, of authority saying like this Pro is... Authority, pride, this and is our a language. little more specifically? And you also get a link to every single person who has followed in that tradition. You get to so, say, so, so we get, stand in the line of the greatest cultural attainment that human beings have reached. I put that in quotes, but that's, that's what you say. When you take a sonnet, this is gonna help you and also seem to help you, so you guys can work it out. <laughs> you say, if you're Claude McKay, you say, I'm writing a Shakespearean sonnet. I am tapping in just as Churchill does when he steals my poem. He takes the poem of a Jamaican communist and he makes it Shakespearean and reads it to the, to the Shakespearean effect on the BBC to encourage his people to remember the great cultural attainment of the English, of the English language. So McKay is saying, if you kill me, this is to help you here. Sure. If you kill me, you kill the cultural attainment of all of us who speak the language, you kill Culture, you kill yourselves. So go ahead, kill me and kill Shakespeare. I'm Shakespeare, I, I can do this. It's, so Anna, go ahead. I, 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 I mean, great, great, okay, great. Like you've reached the highest cultural attainment. You've reached it, now go beyond it. So who, 
So who, we were, we're back to this question of audience. Who, Ali, is being addressed, maybe, when he says, oh, kinsman? Who's he talking to besides, we, we've sort of danced around the issue that if you're in the street and you're being attacked by dogs and someone gets up on a soapbox and starts reciting a Shakespearean sign, you're probably not really gonna be able to hear the nuances of it. Well, in a weird, almost twisted way, O Kinsman could actually include um, the them, the enemy, just for that reason, because- But who specifically? Who's being addressed? Dave, who's being addressed? I think he's talking to the establishment, basically saying, this is a warning. This is what's going on. Who's being addressed in addition, Emrys? Well, racists, I would say. People who are persecuting blacks. Are those his kinsmen? Who, who, Emily, who's Isn't being talking addressed? talking specifically about other blacks, like other black men? That was the first thing we said. Sure. Max, is, is there being addressed? Could he be, since I think we sort of started talking about this, could he be addressing his literary kin then? This is the lineage, the kin? canon. Who is it that sees a Shakespearean sonnet and sits up a little higher and says, wow, we humans are Us. not animals? And more. Readers? Everyone, readers, everyone. everyone who reads this poem in an anthology, this is an anthology poem. And everyone who says, this is a Shakespearean sonnet. This writer attained the status of Shakespeare and brought with it, for, bet, for ill or for good, all the baggage that's associated with that, which is high human attainment. So we, we are his kinsmen, we who see Shakespeare as the best expressive version of ourselves. Allie? Yeah, just kind of to respond to um, Anna's point, I think if you want to look at this more, I think there's a way to read this poem almost metapoetically, um, which might kind of just address your concerns about going a step further, because I do think that <sighs> there's a subversion formally in that um, the inevitability of the form kind of mirrors the inevitability of death. Like, there's no point where the, the reason that I think it's appropriate that it doesn't go beyond the kind of traditional form is that, is that in the poem, McKay admits defeat. He, you know, from the outset we know we, if we must die, and there are constant reminders that they're going to die. But, um, and so it never, it doesn't completely undo the form, but it definitely makes an impression. Um, and, and so in the fighting back, um, I think it's, it's the effort is triumphant. Even and how will we fight back? We will fight back like men, like human beings. And I, McKay, the speaker, I am a human being, and the only evidence you need for that fact is that you are reading me writing in a form that is the most complex in terms of rhyme and meter that we can do. It's hard to do this, and I'm taking time to do this as evidence of my humanity. So, you know, it is, as Max says, a kind of revolutionary subversion. You see? Here's a sonnet. It, will leave you looking for some kind of break and some kind of newness, dissatisfied, except if you have, as Ali suggested, some evidence of the self-consciousness of this subversion, that poetry, by its very form, can indicate humanity, where content might not always do that. The, the downside is you've got a poem that's hard to understand if you're running away from the dogs, but it's a poem that's not being addressed to those of his times being addressed to us, those who can link Shakespeare from the 17th century uh, all the way to, uh, to us today.